When looking at the watch market here today in 2020, it's quite hard for an independent brand to really break through with so many brands out there really just calling home underneath larger group structures. But amongst all these brands that are trying, I think one brand that is excelling exceptionally is that of Habring 2, a small family-owned business in Austria that I think personally is one of the best kept secrets in all of watchmaking. So I'm really excited to be reviewing this watch today. You may have heard me speak of Habring 2 in passing on the channel in the past, but it's just hard to get your hands on their pieces as of, you know, they're only making 200 pieces a year. So that's very low production volume. But today we actually have probably one of my favorite models from the brand with the Chrono Felix, with this one coming in a salmon dial. I wanna look a little bit into the backstory of the brand itself, because I think that will help fill in a little bit of the blanks in terms of how were they able to develop what they're developing and give some backstory and appreciation for what the brand is developing. And also before we jump into this video, John, who's a great follower of the channel, actually sent this watch in for review, but the crazy scenario is he purchased the watch and right from the retailer that was selling this watch, had it shipped right to me uh, before he even got to experience the watch itself. So I really appreciate that, John. Thank you for making this possible. So I wanna give you a great shout out here. To start here, you might be wondering why is this brand a secret or not that well known? So I wanted to provide with a little bit of backstory of this humble husband and wife duo in Austria, Richard and Maria Habring. And the name of Richard Habring might ring some bells. He was responsible for a great contribution to the world of watchmaking in his time as a watchmaker at IWC by developing their Doppel chronograph using a module on the Valju 7750 in 1992, being first unveiled in their 3711 reference. Following his stint at IWC, Richard moved to Langa until going into business for himself with his wife in 2004. And in the years following, they've managed to take home several GPHG awards, the Oscars of watchmaking, and their development of several noteworthy timepieces like their Deadbeat Seconds, their own Doppel chronograph that uses the same idea conceived by Richard in his time at IWC, and have made their way into developing their own movements. And I think the reason why I appreciate this brand and I was really excited to review one of their watches was I think they just epitomized what watchmaking was for centuries. It was family run, it was small, not pretentious, and I think that's very refreshing. So I'm excited to be looking at this piece here today, the Chrono Felix with the salmon dial. Looking at this watch, we have a case size of 38.5 millimeters, thickness of 12 millimeters, lug width of 20 millimeters, lug to lug of 45.6 millimeters, water resistance of 30 meters. For a movement here, we have their manual A11C H1, crystal, sapphire on the front, and then also on the back. First, when looking at this watch on the wrist, we have a very nice fit all around that I think would be favorable for many different watch enthusiasts. With the 38 and half millimeter case, we have a case size that is going to wear rather classical in terms of chronographs, but also here we have a favorable lug to lug and nice slim thickness of 12 millimeters, which certainly is assisted as a result of the manual caliber within. The watch overall should work well in a variety of wrists from under six inches or around 15 centimeters to wrist sizes of seven and a half inches or just over 19 centimeters. The case is finished in a polish on the front of the case, lugs and bezel, and has a brushing on the sides of the case. The bezel here is rather thick, which is also going to make the dial appear a bit smaller when it is strapped on, but you're getting more reason to draw attention there uh, as we'll get into a little bit later. However, the interesting aspect of the watch is on the right side of the case when looking straight on, we do have an unsigned crown at the three, but also the inclusion of a mono pusher to activate the chronograph that is smooth in its action. And I think in this case works exceptionally on this smaller case in providing added charm to a watch that is already exuding it. Looking within the sapphire crystal, we have my favorite feature of this watch, which is this salmon colored dial. A dial color that I have seen being rolled out quite a bit more as of late, which I am 100% behind this trend. To point to the most noteworthy aspects, we have two registers. Each of them have fine circular groove points that add an element of texture to an already impressive texture provided by the central dial with this kind of wood-like aesthetic with a thin wood line finish. At the center of the dial, we have a typical three hand set with the hour and minute hand coming in a sword style and a pointed second hand in black. 
At the 12, we have the writing of Havring II, Austria, and along the outside, a simple minute track and reflective hour markings, which play with the light in an interesting way. As you'll notice that they turn it kind of a dark shade of charcoal or slate gray when looking directly on in a certain light, and then show their natural reflective silver when looking at the chronophilics at other angles. And when factoring this all together, it really offers a unique dial that is exceptional in the looks department. Flipping over this watch, we have view of one of Habring's proprietary movements, their A11C H1. So a little background about Habring and their movements. In the early days of the company, much of their production was completed by highly modifying ETA Valju movements, where they were gradually cut off by ETA since they were producing such low number of watches, which led them to look for other alternatives in designing their own movements and production strategy. Now, basically how these are constructed, and they're pretty transparent about this, they use a network of small family-owned manufacturers in Austria, Germany, and Switzerland, and have managed to get every single part needed to construct their own movements and are hand-assembled and regulated in-house. And I don't wanna to get too much in the semantics of the term in-house, given the production parts are outsourced. However, there's certainly a lot of thoughtfulness with this movement here, despite its rather industrial looks. And of course, all of them being touched by a master watchmaker like Richard Habring, that really does add to this whole situation here. And I'm gonna link in the description to a very interesting video. Richard Habring did a presentation uh, to the Horological Society of New York, where he goes into detail about how their movements are constructed, how we develop this chain, how they develop this chain of suppliers to be able to do this and design their movements and what kind of went into that thought after getting cut off from ETA. It's really interesting to get a transparent view of this world and the independence as well as movement construction because I think this is one of the shady areas of the world of watches where people are not very honest about what is going on with the movement construction. So taking a closer look at this manual movement, the design architecture of the manual Valju 7760 can be seen. First, the movement lever system is optimized to support the mono pusher layout and comes in with a rather slim six and a half millimeters in thickness. The movement is finished in an industrial look, featuring a fine grain line finish across the bridges of the caliber, which features blue screws, a blue cam, and perlage finish on the base plate. The movement operates at 28,800 beats per hour, four hertz, contains 25 joules, the movement is fully hackable, so stopping the seconds when you pull out the crown to the farthest position, and has a power reserve of 48 hours. But perhaps the coolest part about this movement is knowing that it was control tested by Richard Habring himself, which even for an independent watchmaker nowadays, it's just damn cool to be able to say that you're able to actually wear a watch that was actually touched by the man or woman that has their name on the dial. And as a result, this watch is actually running at a second a day of perfect time. But just to kind of echo my points and excitement, when looking at a brand like Habring II, you get a glimpse of what the classic world of watchmaking was, where egos and hype don't really have a place, but instead a simple focus on the craft itself. And for the right type of buyer, this is one of the coolest entry points into the world of high-end independence, that instead of asking for Patek and AP prices, is asking for Omega and Rolex prices. All right, guys, well, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit the bell icon. Also, I'd love to hear your thoughts about this brand, this watch. And uh, again, big thank you to John for sending this watch to me. I love the way this watch, I just love the way this watch looks. I love the way that it wears on the wrist. I think Habring is just such a great, interesting brand. And in a world of independence, very rarely get the shine. And with many that aren't perhaps doing it for the right reasons, it's very refreshing to be able to cover a watch and a brand that seems to be doing it for all the right reasons. In addition, if you wanna see some great photos of watches and stay up to date with the content, what's coming next, be sure to follow me on Instagram as well. So guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I will see you all very soon.